And what we are trying to present here is the fact that uh, many times we hear the story, yeah, yeah, Agile works, but with Embedded, it doesn't. And, and we want to challenge that statement because both of us have many years of experience of actually applying Agile to hardware development, system engineering, and in particular to embedded software development. So how are we going to do that? First we want to create a bit of context, then we want to challenge you with some of the statements we hear every day when we go to company and say, we would like to go Agile, but we can't because it's not possible to do this, this and that if you work in an embedded software development. We will ask you also what are your sentences that you prefer somehow and what are the challenges you encounter when we work in an agile uh, environment in specifically in system engineering. So it's a very bit con of context uh, just to make the point clear. When we talk about embedded software development, we talk about something which relates mostly to system engineering and we are talking about software which is customly built to run on hardware which is part of the product. And this we shouldn't forget because most of the time people think only at the software part of the problem but they don't realize that actually the added value comes when you have the whole system, the whole product running. That's one of the first things we need to acknowledge in many places we end up starting to implement Agile only on the software side and implementing Agile on the software side in lean terms is equivalent to local optimization. Because the value of your product, if we look at system, and these are all systems we are very familiar with, okay, we use most of this system every day, guess the one we don't use every day. <laughs> and uh, uh, we are very good client and supporter of Airbus, as you can imagine, we have many miles on our shoulder every day, flying. But uh, in general, when we talk about system engineering, the value is entailed in the system as a whole. And the software is just a part of it. Like the firmware is another part of it, and the hardware is another part of it. So, the first thing we need to keep in mind when we talk about Agile development, in general, we have to think about that Agile development is about streamlining the value or the way we produce value for the client. And if we want to apply that to system engineering and in particular to embedded software, we need to focus that statement on the product as a whole and not only on the software part. Okay? There are some technical challenges in integrating hardware, software and firmware in shorter sprints, sometimes of 15 days. I'm not saying it's easy. We are saying it's possible and we have evidence of it. So, so the first thing we'd like to do is, what are your uh, statements about why Agile doesn't work in an embedded environment? Anyone who has a good statement about why it doesn't work? The basic question is, does it work better, first and place, and why yeah. it doesn't work? And second, uh, you have a lot of asynchronous processes, as at least that is what you hear. Yeah. So lead time and turnaround times dependencies uh, to others outside the team. Asynchronous processes, not yeah. just promise situations. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any other? Anybody else? So why are you at this conference then? <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible to break the mechanical and uh, hardware stuff into small chunks that you can manage it is in a sprint. It's not okay. possible. It's impossible. We hear that every time. <laughs> Anybody else? No? Okay, so let's have a look back. Explain yeah, some let's of these. take the first one. Well, the first statement we hear is we cannot have potential releasable functionality in four weeks or less. It's simply impossible, is what we hear. Anybody familiar with that? Probably, right? So another one which is very interesting is there is so much diversity when we develop system engineering that is impossible to put all the required skills into a single cross-functional team. So we can't do Agile. Because we have hardware expertise, we have electronics, we have electrics, we have mechanics, we have various types of software, real-time, not real-time, operating system, driver, and so on and so forth. Okay? The team will be 50 people, we can't do Agile. The third one, first we must develop the hardware, then comes software cannot be done in parallel. It is simply impossible. 
That was cool, the deep one. So. <laughs> and then we have another one, which is continuous integration and automated testing does not work in hardware development, or in particular in embedded software development. You can't do that, okay? Because only to integrate the system takes centuries, if not longer, and so it's impossible to have short feedback loop. Sometimes when we come out to clients, they have done a little study about what Agile is before they call us, and some of them have been reading the Agile Manifesto, and remember to read the 12 principles behind it. Quoting that, welcoming changing requirements even late in development. Hello, Earth calling the Agile coach. How can we do that? And then we have uh, this one, we already learned. Lead, lead time can be six weeks or more, okay? The reason is that when you develop system engineering, you normally rely on a lot of external partners, and these external partners are not doing agile, and they don't care at all if you have a sprint of two weeks ending next week, they have their own agenda. So they are doing the work according to their service level agreement, and if you are lucky, you get something back in six weeks. If you are lucky, as I said. And the final one we have collected here is user stories do not work for embedded system development. Should I write a user story like, as the main board in the product, I would like to be feed with current so that I can work? Probably not. This is the thing we already heard about. It's not possible to develop hardware or software components in just two week time. Okay? So now a little bit of where we are coming from. As I said, I'm, I'm basically I started as an embedded software engineer working for, uh, for a company making uh, car control engine equipment for injection, ABS control system and stuff like that uh, back in 97, uh, the first time. And uh, I'm coming from that corner, so I'm, I, I tasted on myself the difficulties of trying to do something different, of cross-compilation, of short feedback cycle on a platform in 1997 was rather challenging where we were launching network compilation jobs and waiting until the morning after to have a 64 kilobit uh, image to, to test on our apron. Uh, today there are a lot better possibilities than that and we are presenting just two case studies uh, on which we worked, both me and Ben. And uh, we have many more than these, but these are the recent one and are the one who can kind of cover most of the statement that we presented to you. So I was surprised that because normally we do this anonymous, but when I told the guys we were going to talk about their project, they said, well, we want to sponsor it. And then they asked to put the logo there and review all the picture and all the rest. So Ericsson Optical Network Infrastructure is a part of Ericsson which works very hardly on the backbone infrastructure system. Here is a typical situation, so the, the hardware they build looks like a, a big rack for mostly for telecom company or backbone uh, uh, network for smaller uh, villages or also for, for big cities depending on how many board you put, so it's stackable. And they came from the typical classical engineering approach, requirement first, let's do requirement engineering. After some months, if not years, you have everything clear and specified, then you start with hardware development, and when hardware is nearly done, then you start thinking about software development. And all of this done with distributed teams across the globe in four different locations. This was a relatively small project actually, because most of the project we coached over the year, we were dealing with seven, eight different locations, okay? Going from Vancouver, Canada to Beijing in China. Hmm? Uh, all across Europe and Middle East. The situation was typical, the challenges you probably are familiar with. The release cycle and feedback loops are very long. Major product release happen in between 12 and 18 months time, not faster than that. And uh, 12 is mostly the very, very optimistic situation. Uh, even if they plan for 12, most of the time they slip to 15 or 18 months due to requirement changing at the last minute. They have very high business risk because there are multiple customer change requests coming in mostly toward the end of a project. Also, this is probably unfamiliar to many of you. And it's very difficult to merge and figure out how to combine all these requirements in one single product. Some of them are also conflicting, so it requires a lot of conversation and uh, capability to, to manage uh, 
conflict and somehow go to compromises. And I number of competing change requests, very tight deadline, distributed development, which requires a lot more of synchronization to work and detailed planning up front. And here my comment is really, we are not sure about that, but this is what people say. And average time before full test integration is over six months for the first serviceable hardware prototypes. What does it mean? If you are not familiar with that, when you develop a board, you have various stages of development. Uh, the first prototype of a board can be as big as, as four, four or five square meter of, of uh, patch the cable in one another just to test electronic and electrics stuff. And only after six months you get a first prototype which has a form factor which you need to actually go in production and it's serviceable, meaning you can actually bootstrap that board and see if the electronics at least does what it's supposed to do. And the average time before, uh, sorry, the, the split responsibility distributed on a very large number of roles. Also, this is probably something you are familiar with if you are in a large corporation. You tend to have a silos of competence split all around uh, many, many different uh, uh, roles around the world also. So it makes it very difficult to make decisions fast and to react to customer change because most of the time you have a full committee of people that needs to be involved to discuss all the stuff. So what we did there, very short summary. So we started doing some crazy stuff like having up distributed cross-functional team with hardware, firmware and software working together till about 10 people, okay? They were not fully featured team, that's a different story. They were not able alone to produce end-to-end uh, -end feature, but they were able to integrate hardware, firmware and software and we forced them to work in what we call normally a distributed scrum system. Hardware was developed in China, firmware was developed in Sweden and software was developed in Germany and Italy, okay? And each of them was supposedly doing its part and putting all in the same pot, mixing it up and opening, hoping it was working. So what we did instead, even though we only had two hour times of overlapping between Europe and China, we forced them to work in this fully distributed scrum teams. Meaning we had two people in Sweden, two people in Germany, two people in Italy and three or four people in China working in the same team and doing stand-up meeting over these two hour times on overlapping and doing pairing on the headphone looking at the same screen for those two hours every day. And then they developed firmware and software in parallel to the hardware development. We'll see later how they did it. And the team focused on feature and not technology. This was the biggest change. Get away from technical specification and the whole team think about how to solve problems because user stories our problem statement, are not solution. User story tells you who needs what and why. And you can break it down to a level where specifically it requires you to explicit which tools you need to do what and why. Here is some example of a lab change. If you look on the right side, we have very primordial hardware prototypes, are mostly boards with a lot of cable connecting every direction. We have external battery, external antenna changes to make some uh, uh, bandway transportation check or a denial of service attack check and so on and here there's a lot of equipment at the end all of this will end up in a small 19 inches rack box okay which is probably between 40 to 60 centimeter high and that's a module which can host in terms of backbone up to 60 terabit per second transfer rate okay real time so what we had, how to make a testing in short cycle, every two weeks people were able, after the first three sprint, okay, after six weeks, they had the first serviceable prototype, which was looking like that instead of our nice 19 inches rack, and uh, they were able to start running the first test, meaning bootstrapping the machine and checking the service levels. And this was done all in the lab. Then they started writing automated tests. Then Bent has a nice example of how you can actually do robotized tests as well on hardware later on. And deliver service for product in just two months' time and release incrementally with higher quality from that moment on every two weeks. The second uh, case here is uh, a smaller company than Ericsson. It uh, is, however, work leading in its own uh, business, it's about audio processing. And uh, what I will take you through here is, uh, first of all, how this company 
chose to organize after starting the agile transition and take you through how the team there uh, initiated a new platform project for some audio processing. So uh, originally this uh, company has uh, tried to mature the way they, they're doing projects. They have developed a product, uh, formed a project office. They had a normal matrix organization with lines, product management lines, hardware lines, software line, mechanical line, and of course operations. And forming Whenever they run a new project, forming projects across those lines with project managers. They actually had four for a, a 40 person development department. They had like four project managers. They had four line managers as well. Good. So when they're doing the agile transition, they decided to stay, okay, let's start having focus on business instead of focus on technical skills. Instead of being great to do technical stuff, we want to make awesome products. So therefore they formed three business units and each of, that, each of those business units were actually a cross-functional scrum team. Around 10 people in each team. And within that team they did the very best to have as many skills as required to get the job done for an end-to-end -end responsibility. Once in a while they had to uh, borrow a talent, not a resource, a talent from one of the other teams, but mostly they were actually able to get the whole job done. Starting up a new platform project, they decided to do it the agile way. Instead of spending months of specification, months of gathering requirements, months of detail in the design. They decided to do it the agile way because they had good experience with it already. This team here had worked actually together for several years as an agile team when they did this. So it's about forming the vision. Why are we actually going to do that? What are the user and customer needs? Is it worth doing? This is from the western part of Denmark and it's like Scottish people, is it really worth doing this or not? So they formed a vision and based on that vision, uh, the team made some initial technology decisions. What kind of DSPs do we want? What kind of host processes do we want? And as many of you probably know, deciding on technology is more than just deciding on the right performance of the components that we choose. It's also about how long time can we believe that this vendor will be in the business, that we can keep on getting the components. The old platform that this company, this team was uh, replacing has been around for more than 15 years. So it's also about how long time can we get those components. More popular speaking, which vendors do we want to get into bed with? The team made the, the technology decision and uh, based on that, the team met with people from business, the product owner was of course there, uh, and uh, the scrum master, and in a three day workshop, they wrote their first product backlog. They decided, let's write the back backlog with the knowledge we have about the product right now. Just very brief, just good enough to get started. Three days they did that, wrote the backlog, estimated the backlog. Then uh, they were actually able to form a neutral plan, saying, well, we see that the, uh, based on the uh, estimate of the backlog, our knowledge about how many story points can we do every sprint, we get an idea about how many sprints do we actually need to do that. So they went to the steering committee, they said, well, it's so and so many story points, that's this project, and the steering committee looked at the team and said, mm, what does that mean? Well, that means so and so many sprints, we think. That means the cost is like that. So even though it was an agile team, they were able to communicate to the, uh, to the stakeholders our assumption about time and cost for doing this project. 
And based on that, they um, made their first product on a board where the backlog was shown here with the vision, the minimal marketing features, the uh, user stories, and uh, all the things they needed to do to get it done. And the steering committee said, go on, this is good. Wait. Go back a minute. Can I go back? Yeah, just, I just want to talk about it. So this team spent like three days on getting the plan. Fine enough, at the same time working with this team, I worked with another customer who apparently also were making a new platform project. The same size, the same number of man years those two products had, products had. This other client had taken the traditional approach on forming the plan. They had spent 5,000 hours on gathering requirements, analyzing, writing specifications. This team spent three days, that's like 200 hours. So they were 25 times faster to get to this realization. They had a high focus on, as much as possible, show results every sprint, and they were running three-week sprints. So instead of just let the hardware people go to the chamber and start working on the schematics, let the software people pick their nose a little bit and wait until something was able so they could start producing the software, they decided to make a minimal viable product. And this is the first here. This is actually the first version of the product. And guess what? The team in Sense of Hardware had only developed wires for this. Because they bought a lot of um, evaluation boards from the different technology vendors that they chose. So there was one uh, evaluation board for the DSPs, one evaluation board for the host processor and two elevation boards for the interfaces they wanted to put in this product. So very early they could start developing the software, the firmware, the algorithms and sprint by sprint, since this is audio processing, sprint by sprint, whenever they reach their sprint review, they were able to hear how this product worked because they had already the first minimal viable product. A little later, or, or let me just say, when, when the, all the decisions were made, of course the hardware developers were moving that, drawing that in the schematics. And uh, when they got their first real prototype, that is picture number two of the main board, this is a nine-layer high-speed board with one host processor, two DSPs. When they got that, the day they got that, after half an hour, they were running the host processor. By the end of the day, they were running algorithms on the board. It usually takes months to get to that. So that was pretty fast. And uh, finally, we ended up with the last uh, the board with the uh, interface as it is. Uh, this is actually taken from the web. This is what went into production. Okay, so let's try to bust the myth we have listed before. All the sentences one by one and see how we can relate to that. So we cannot have potential or releasable functionality in four weeks. What can you tell about this, Ben? Well, the important thing is that you show results that you have agreed on and they are valuable. And you do that every sprint. Challenge yourself, challenge the organization, the traditional thinking. Can we find 
I turn to verif ways to verify your design. Maybe you can get something else to verify. This is the design. This is right. What we're doing. Yeah. From my side, my experience is that uh, if you stick to the word potentially releasable functionality, and you think of that as the thing you want to sell to your client, you end up probably starting thinking that you can do sellable product in two weeks. And the answer to that is probably no, you can't. Okay? Because if products are big enough, it requires some time to develop. But what can you can do every two weeks is actually validating assumption, finding out if your guesses about the technology being right or wrong are okay or not, you can have sprint goals which are about verifying or evaluating three different DSPs provider or three different way of connecting board circuit and being able to actually demonstrate based on some criteria that one way is better than another because provide you more efficiency, more bit rate, more stability and so on. Okay? So depending on where you are, you have to think as we said before in terms of value and value has always two components. One is client value and the other part of value that we always forget is knowledge. So when we build complex products for the first time, developing knowledge and building knowledge about what we are doing is also as valuable as what you produce for the client. If you don't know what you are doing, you won't be able to give the client anything innovating. You keep on giving him the same soup cooked different every time. And that's relatively easy. You don't need the Scrum or Agile for that. If you want to do something innovative instead, you are always confrontating and challenging everything you did until that moment in time and trying to find new way to do it. New way which add value for the final customer. So in terms of value produced, in terms of knowledge, at the beginning of a project, you are challenging a lot of assumptions, you are evaluating a lot of options and you have a lot of sprint goals which are about stabilizing technology, evaluating performance and stuff like that. And it's not just theory, you see people taking cables, going there, plugging in stuff, writing some fast test for the, for the system to load it and check how it's reacting to some specific load. Okay, so it is possible in both uh, this example we present, but in many other, uh, I did also when I started developing uh, um, car control engine equipment, we were also doing a lot of simulation using MATLAB and we have a lot of, of uh, uh, sprint goal which were about simulating the interference disturbance load of certain part of the circuit and we could already do that. Myth number two. Myth number two is there is too much diversity in the required skills for a cross-functional team. What do we say about that? Well, uh, in our experience we actually forced to have cross-functional team uh, to some extent. At the beginning it was relatively hard, you can imagine how hard it is to have a team with Swedish people, Italian, German and Chinese working together every day and having only two hours a day to actually talk with each other. The first two, three sprints were relatively difficult, but as soon as the team started to see the advantage of having that fast feedback loop, of having a change in the firmware, modification in the hardware and the next sprint having already a board with those changes on top, they immediately started appreciating the effort they were putting into making it happen. And with insight, I have an email from the product owner, which was Italian, and he said, when we started doing this, I was already thinking we are going, you know, train crashing against the wall, because this is never going to work, too many cultural differences, too many problems. But then you talk to them and say, guys, you build this company based on cultural difference. So it's, it's your culture in the company, so what's wrong if people work tight with each other? You always said you have international teams, right? And then it comes out, yeah, we say we have an international team, but we ne never really work as teams, right? And that's part of, of one problem we're going to analyze later on, which is about culture. So, yes? A system, the architecture of the system is usually reflecting the organization behind the system. So if you are making split silos of developers developing a system, then you get a a split system as well. When you have cr real cross-functional team with software, hardware, mechanics and whatever else you need, you get good solutions, you get the problem solved where the problem is supposed to be solved in the system. And that's important. And one thing you avoid with that is the typical ping-pong game. So we did the firmware right, it doesn't work, it's a software problem. And then one week later the software makes the 
debugging and say, no, it's not our problem, it's an other problem. And then the other guys go and look at the other, they do all the oscilloscopic tests of the world, they bring out report and they say, no, our other work that's specified is not our problem, it's a firmware problem. And then you keep on going like that, introducing a lot of feedback delays, and this is just killing the whole product development. The next one. First, we must develop the hardware, then comes software. It cannot be done in parallel. Yeah, I guess you have something we to say. We already this. covered that, IT, because with cross-functional teams and clever ideas on developing minimal viable products, that's not necessarily a fact. The example here of actually building the first product with just develop evaluation boards, buying a lot of evaluation boards, all developers had a product like that. That's so we up this development significantly. Yes, from my side I can say about the same. Uh, the minimum viable product wasn't fitting on a board, but was more likely four square meter of hardware cable together, four or five square meters, and it took John, you are taking a lot of risk on your shoulder. You take business risk, you don't know if you are doing the right thing or not. You are taking a lot of technical risk because you develop hardware. And when we talk about optical board, a single board is over 70,000 euro. So you cannot build one every 15 days and throw it away because it doesn't work. It's increased significantly the cost of development. So before getting to that point, you need to use a lot of demo components, cable them together and see if the concept you are trying to achieve is actually feasible or not. And then you start reducing that 4 square meter size to smaller and smaller form factors until you start challenging then electronic, thermic, which is a big issue, especially with high performing hardware. And when you work with fiber optic, every wrong turn is reducing the efficiency of fibers. So you have to be very careful on how you actually bend the plastic cable. And that is where also a lot of 3D printing helped to see how you can actually make the cable go through that board because we are talking about a lot of fibers moving in there. So, minimal viable product, think out of the box. Don't think about the final product from the first day, but start validating assumptions and options from the beginning. This is a funny one. <laughs> this is the funny one. It's yours. Continuous integration and automated tests does not work in hardware development. Actually, there are several vendors who are making tools that support that. But again, think of the box, out of the box. Maybe you can actually build an automated test tool yourself and it would be fun. For example, this one. This is an electrical mechanical test. This is a broadcast uh, product with a dual PSU and the team needed to verify whenever we pushed the buttons for the two, uh, P, two uh, flows in the PSU, how does it work, how are there some uh, unexpected uh, uh, things happening. And instead of ordering a test tool from a, another department or another vendor, those guys take out the box and how about we go to Toys R Us and buy some Lego miles though. It cost half or maybe even less of what it would have cost from a two, from a, from another vendor. Plus they had it in a couple of hours and it was pretty fun doing that. And this company has sell, several um, examples of using Lego Mindstorm to actually make some initial tests automated tests. That's a funny one, huh? I, you can imagine your development team having more fun developing testing tools with Lego Mindstorm instead of the product itself. Statement 5. Welcome. Well, yeah. right. Welcome changing requirements, even late in development. How can you do that in an Arduino project? Coaches help us. You go. So, when you're building iteratively incrementing, when you're verifying your requirements are validating on the way that actually reduces the stress of change and the risk. So verifying over and over again that you are doing the right things will actually help you also be agile and change your requirements even late in the process. 
So what we learn from Agile, if you understand really iterative and incrementally, and you include in the process of iterative and incremental also the discovery part of it, means you don't aim to do the things right the first time. That's rather stupid. Even, even if we, we think it's going to save us a lot of money, at the end of the day, it forces us to make decisions so early in the project where we have the lowest knowledge about it. And if you do the wrong thing and you find out later that it's wrong and you already spent thousands and thousands of millions of euros in developing an hardware, then the only chance which is remained, which is mostly where we land, is that the software needs to fix the fact that the hardware doesn't do what it should do. And that's becoming even more expensive. So instead of having that approach, we learned the hard way that it's better to have something temporary or uh, in some way just functional so that we can develop all the three layers in parallel, constantly. And if we come at the end of every iteration in a stable state again, which is inspectable and allow us to bootstrap the product, to check it's working and so on, then the cost of change is relatively low because we know we have a stable state. The changes are very painful if you are in the middle of a 12 months development cycle and close to the end you start getting changes but you don't know yet what you have in your hand. That's a big issue. Then you start making the famous impact analysis. What does it mean for our project if the client changes this requirement? How much work we already did on that without even validating it one time? How much money are we going to throw away? And then you start a lot of uneasy discussion with the client and you try to ask him more money because now this change is completely different from the one he, he was asking before, even if eventually it's actually simpler from his perspective than what he wanted to have at the beginning. But because your process is so entangled with the way you are thinking and you spend already a lot of money in it, you tend to say, ah, yeah, but this changes completely the thing and you have to pay us a lot of money for that, okay? That's not the way Agile people work. We try to collaborate instead of working hard on a contract deadline and the way we do that is by providing incrementally valuable uh, results which are measurable, which are inspectable and which allow us to validate an assumption and reducing the risk over time. And then we build the final version of the hardware toward the end. So in the, in the Ericsson project we had like six to eight hardware iteration depending on the complexity of the project and the first one as I said was about four or five square meter of uh, uh, whatever words cable together and then we had, it, it is evolving over time and eventually coming down to the final form factor where you can uh, really do a lot of more detailed testing. But you learn all on the way and you reduce the risk because the amount of decision you have to make at the beginning are measured to the amount of outcomes you can generate and validate at the same time. Next statement, lead time can be six weeks or more. Is that actually a fact? Usually that's something I hear from procurement. Oh, if you want this produced in China or Taiwan in the end, then we of course also need to have the first samples from there. Why? I just wanted from the vendor that next next to us down the corner. So it's about figuring out, it's about challenge yourself, it's about challenge the organization, especially procurement. How can we get this faster? Can we spend a little more money on getting it in 24 hours instead instead of in six weeks? One of the other one of the other client I work with in Denmark, a very small startup company, there were two in the beginning. They are making consumption meters for water and so on. Well, they are every day challenging themselves, how can we verify this fast? How can we get a result fast? Of course, they bought a 3D printer, but when it comes to electronics, they are also doing this. So, yes, you increase the cost on the development, but you are getting knowledge faster, which is beneficial. Yeah, I think that's a big trade-off, and uh, the thing is that and we come maybe toward the final point now, but the decision here is how much is worth waiting? How much is costing you to wait before knowing something? How much risk are you taking? How much is the value of the risk? Is it worth saving $200 or 200 euro on a component that you build in China? Or is it better to build it around the corner where you can actually take the car or even walk? to your partner and look at the board together and give him direct feedback and having a new board every two weeks isn't that really so expensive, more expensive than actually 
going to China and how many demo board you will develop during the development cycle of a product? How many are you going to throw away? If any. Is that, is that cost really so heavy on the development? This is the challenge you have to face yourself and make trade-off decision on that one because uh, it's definitely, in my opinion, very stupid to develop hardware in Taiwan or in China in the course of the software development where, where you are still developing the product as well because it, the, the money you saved on that in, at expenses of having six or week or more of delay time is not worth it. User stories do not work for embedded system development. <laughs> well, we have many examples of user story working. The, the thing is, what do you put in a user story? And here we have many, many uh, years of experience in going to the client. Yeah, we wrote a user story. As a product owner, I want you to do that. Or as a DSP, I need the signal, so and so, because then I can measure it. And then you go and look, okay, what's the value? Who is the DSP? Is paying you money? Is it your client? Why is the stakeholder of a user story? So when you focus the team and help them creating context on who needs what and why, you are actually helping them thinking out of the box. If you force them on technical detail and you tell them you need to implement it, then they will do it. And guess what? It doesn't work in the end what they do. Hey, we did exactly what you asked for. If it doesn't work, it's not my problem. We follow the specification. And that way of thinking works relatively well when you develop not too complex product. Or better said, when you try to solve not too complex problem. Okay? Because the better products are the ones which are simple and are solving a complex matter. It's much better than having a complex problem to solve simple <laughs> stuff. Okay? And that tends to happen better when you focus the team on the context and on the value why they are doing it. So when the team understands the user need, understand why we are doing this, the team start making wise decisions on their own. That was what I experienced as a product owner. That the team came to me and said, well, we have this and this problem, we did so and so. So self-organization is supported by this. It, the life of the product owner becomes so much more easier because the team knows to make the decisions. So now we come a little bit to the hot potatoes here. The one who is burning. Why is it so difficult in embedded or in system engineering to actually adopt Agile? And the fundamental reason we see behind it is mostly a cultural reason. Software development and product development stems out of system engineering company, out of the production processes, most cases. So I remember still when I started developing software, we were considered an accident. The product was the hardware and we had to develop embedded software and all the problems were in the software. And we were the stupid guys in the company because we weren't able to make a silly hardware work. And for hardware perspective, People were telling us, hey, you are just having to put zero and one digitally on a jumper. What is the problem with that? Why are you not able to make it work? And then over time they realized that actually 90% of the value which was delivered by that piece of hardware was actually in the software. And the thing is, many companies still having a hard time understanding that developing software is a complex challenge and developing hardware board might become a linear, complicated challenge which is different. You have a set of repeatable mechanical activity which produce over and over again the same product. That doesn't work with software. You don't have screws. You don't have jumpers. You don't have pins. Okay? Every requirement is different. So that is where most of the problem comes out. When we talk about culture, let me shortly refer to the diagram that William Schneider presented and he, he, he focusing on, on the four, four fundamental stem of culture or types of culture we can have within an organization. There are culture on two dimensions here. One, visualizing priority over the system instead of people, and one visualizing the possibility versus actuality of a culture. It means this culture are very strongly focused on the present and these are very strongly focused on the future. What can we possibly do? So, it comes out that because of many years of tailor management implemented since 1911, 
when Taylor first wrote the Scientific Management Treaty, we are ending up with a lot of companies which have a traditional hierarchical structure which was originally aiming at solving one problem, which was producing as many goods as possible because the demand on the market was much higher than the capacity we had in production. So the whole structure was about reducing the cost of production by hiring unskilled people and having them do cheaper work job coordinated by a manager who was con uh, the, the, uh, the know-how man and was kind of coordinating the whole process. Okay? That turns out to be very effective, especially when you have repeatable activities. But once you have every time a different thing, and we're talking about developing in a more complex or complicated environment, that type of approach doesn't really work well. So we come out, in every organization, there are probably more than one core culture, but most of the organization, especially coming out of system engineering, are strongly focused on control. What does it mean? It means that their culture tendentially believes that success stands in controlling everything that happens very good, very uh, well. And here is where we have all the abomination when we talk about impersonal culture. We talk about full-time equivalent. We don't even call people by name anymore. We need 50% of a tester. And then I said, okay, when we need an electrical tester, please give me the 50% where the head stand. I don't need the feet, okay, if we have to choose one. So that is something that is very difficult to understand in this type of culture. We are not asking people to drill holes in a, in a piece of metal, okay? It's not just mechanical activity. It requires a lot of concentration. And there are cultures which strongly base they are success on collaboration. They truly believe collaboration is the way to go, meaning people working together, sharing skills, developing. Other cultures believe in cultivation. Cultivation means cultivating talents, developing people and innovating constantly. Other culture believes more in competence. And here we have companies who are strongly developing talent but towards specialization means they narrow more and more the scope of someone, but it, it gets the deepest possible knowledge. And as you might know, that's a big impediment when you work in an agile environment, because you end up with 50 people in a cross-functional team. Because every one of those 50 people can only do that much in the all end to end development chain you need for a product. That's a cultural issue. What Snyder tells us also is that culture might extend, extend in one way, sometimes, or in the other way. But the, the culture on the opposites of the quadrant are incompatible with one another. Now the bad news is, Agile and Lean stands on that side. And why is that a bad news? Because when you try to introduce Scrum in an organization which is strongly based on control, it's like putting a virus into a body. So either you protect the virus, or within some months you will be attacked by so many anticorps that the old Scrum effort will basically fail because it doesn't fit to that company organization. So when we do agile transformation, we focus very much on understanding what the culture of the company is because you might introduce agile in different ways depending where the culture develops. We don't want to fight against the culture, we want to use the advantages of that culture to actually make the introduction of agile more natural. And ultimately, we want people to come to a point where they can innovate, they can stop actually reproducing the same thing all over again, and they can really focus on innovation and developing talents. Why is the culture so important? And why it's difficult today in many companies, and especially in system engineering? Because when we look at results at the top of our pyramid, and we think we can get those results to constant actions. And, and you see the pyramid because most of the action don't actually bring to results. You know, you have also waste. Not everything you plan and you do actually brings to what you expect to achieve. This is why there is somehow part of it going away. And we also know that depending on the company, people in that company will make decisions based on their beliefs. What are beliefs? It's not about religion. It's about the experience that people made in that company which makes them believe or learn what is right and what is wrong. What does your company apprise and what does your company punish? To learn this, people normally require between six 
to 12 months, depending on how complicated and extended is your organization. And most of the time, what we fail in doing is that we focus always on the last mile. We keep on adding more and more control, more and more management to actually steer the last mile action toward the result. And down here, we have a lot of the spirit, demotivation, people don't understand why everything they do is wrong and always comes in a manager or a hero and fix the problem. Because we need to achieve result, okay? And this is where your culture sit. This is where your people are working in. And what we encourage company doing is to shift the balance from management to leadership for a starting and start working together with the employee making experience to form the new culture that you want those people to have so that they will be able themselves to choose the right action and that model will scale much easier and much faster and you will build basically what we call as a resilient organization resilient organization what is a resilient organization is an organization which is able to adapt faster to change than any other because you don't have only one thinking up there and management trying to run after what everyone does in the corridor, but you have an organization which strongly shares a vision, they have a clear goal, they have a common strategy, everyone thinks in a common direction and the likelihood they will react much faster to changes and adopt to those changes is very high. In the current environment, most of the company where we go, this is one of the biggest challenges. And it's not illogical, everyone agrees on this model. Everyone says, of course it's the right way to go, but why you don't do it then? The reason is simple, that's a very long-term investment. You don't see the changes from today, from tomorrow, and it's way too easier to focus on fire reaction rather than fire prevention. When a fire burns, the manager runs, switch it off, done. Okay? And you don't have ever the time to actually focus on investing in building the mindset of the people toward a different direction. Okay? This is in particular in system engineering, in company which comes from hardware development and then ended up having software as an accident. It's very, very strongly established. So one thing I can tell you on this before I give again back the ball to Ben, is whenever you awake in the morning and you want to do IJ, start coaching the person you see in the mirror. That one is the first one. When you do that every day, and I'm telling you I'm doing it since 11 years now, you, you will start things to see that things are changing over and over again. So, this is one of the reasons why we base collaboration in Agile on values and principles rather than rules. Here we have the values and principles, here we have the rules. If you base your collaboration in your company on values and principles, you don't need a lot of rules. Because if you have values and principles and you live up to those values and principles, each individual can, in a given situation, figure out what's best to do. So skip all the rules. Good. Uh, Agile has proven to be very effective. Very, gives a lot of effect compared to the t t t traditional approaches. One of the reasons of that is team organization. And why is team organization important and interesting? Well, that's because of the concept of synergy, meaning that the whole is bigger than the individual parts. For example, here, this Formula One team, six persons, because they are organized as a team, because they have a shared goal, get the car out of the pit stop as fast as possible. Because they have agreed on who's doing what, because they have some principles how we work together, their work will be more than the sum of the work of the individual people in that team. Their work is more than the six individual people's effort. Compared to that, what we have here, Tom Hanks in the movie Cast Away, he was alone on a desert island. Well, he could only do the work that he was able to do. He, he had a companion, he had a volleyball named Wilson, but Wilson was kind of the silent type, if you remember that movie, right? 
So uh, he could only do his uh, own work. In the middle we have a working group, and you can see those are people working in a waterfall project. <laughs> right? They are standing at the bus stop. They are standing there for individual reasons. You might think, yeah, they want to get on the bus. They share, they share information about, is the bus on time, what's the next stop, and so on. But they only share the information to reach individual goals. Their work can never be more than the sum of the individual parts. Something that's a little bit less than that. They have individual goals. They're working in silos. Formula One team or Formula or team team. Uh, let me get this for you. Uh, team organization is the Formula One of organization. They require a lot of maintenance, but they are pretty fast. So the cultural change to start focus on, focusing on teams instead of individuals are important. Okay, some final takeaway because we're running out of time, or we ran already out of time for a couple of minutes. So Agile is simple but isn't easy. Okay, especially applying it to system development might be a little bit tricky, but we can tell you after many years of experience it's definitely worth it. There will be crying, there will be whining, there will be a lot of people saying, oh, the old way was better, but if you all done for a couple of sprints, you will start seeing that people appreciate what you are giving them as an opportunity. And the hardest part is to change the mindset first. To teach people to start thinking out of the box and not follow the rules they always followed, but start following the principle and the values and start thinking again. Remember to focus on value first and technology later. It doesn't matter if we are making smart decisions or smart solutions, if it's the wrong solutions we are making. First of all, see what is important for the user or the customer of this product. And then decide on, okay, which te what kind of technology are we going to use to get to that point. Then we have Agile is rather a new paradigm than a new method. So don't expect to find in Agile the detailed answer of what you need to do now if you want to do embedded Agile. There are a lot of best practices out there, but the practices won't make you Agile. You can adopt all the Agile practices and do the all same thing all over again like you did until now, and you won't dent a single difference in your processes. Possibly you will improve a bit because of the highest bandwidth communication you have if you start working with team which actually meet every day and do a daily stand-up. But that's more or less a byproduct, it's an accident. So if you really focus on Agile, think about it's mostly about thinking different, about teaching people to challenge constraints, about teaching people to see the world, the technology and the product in a different way. And that will happen. There's a difference between being agile and doing agile. Being agile is where the value is. It's a long one. <laughs> so start by changing the constraint, as, as we said, and understand how they are limiting you. Why do you have to wait six weeks lead time before getting the other? Why you don't choose to do it in a different way? Make some evaluation and try always to deliver as shorter feedback cycle as possible and having something inspectable that allows you to learn something. This was it. This was it. Thank you.